Good evening, everybody. Thank you for spending a little bit of your Valentine's Day with me. Um, my internet is acting a little dodgy right now, so I apologize if there's a little bit of a lag between slides, um, but thank you for bearing with me. My name is Lee Bergasa, and I'm the Invasive Program Coordinator for Raleigh Parks. And tonight we're going to be discussing invasive plants, management plans and prescriptions, and some natives that can help us win the fight. The invasive species are the biggest threat to the environment after habitat lost. They grow fast, reproduce quickly, and swiftly overtake the wild areas that we loved. The estimated damage from invasive species worldwide totals more than $1.4 trillion, or 5% of the global economy. The annual U.S. cost from invasives is estimated to be about $120 billion, with more than 100 million acres affected, which is roughly the size of California. U.S. agriculture suffers $30.6 billion in control costs and production losses, a cost that is passed along to consumers through rising food costs. Impacts on power production and transmission drive higher energy bills for consumers. Yes, it's $120 billion a year. Can you see the fire hydrant? If my house was on fire, I would prefer the hydrant not to be smothered in invasive wisteria. Don't know about you. Invasive plants impact human safety with alarming frequency. The negative effect on critical infrastructure, such as power lines, railroads, and bridges, puts us in harm's way. Here you can see a tree brought down by the weight of invasive vines blocking a four-lane road at rush hour. It was big. Watched it fall. Invasive species are capable of causing extinctions of native plants and animals, of reducing bi biodiversity, competing with native or organisms for limited resources, and altering habitats. This not only results in huge economic impacts, but fundamental disruptions of ecosystems. Native ecosystems evolved over thousands of years, developing complex relationships that are deeply dependent. An introduced species has no native predators or diseases, and in many cases has a higher reproductive rate than the native species in competition. Many invasive plant species leaf out earlier or are evergreen and can take better advantage of sunlight to maximize canopy. Specialist feeders are starved out of these monocultures by loss of specific host plants. Forests covered in non-native vines can't regenerate and eventually disappear. Let's talk about disturbance and vectors. Invasive plants thrive on disturbance, whether natural, like windstorms or tornadoes, or unnatural construction that creates forest fragments and vulnerable edge habitats. Wind, water, and animals naturally distribute seed and other propagules into green spaces where they exploit disturbed and exposed areas. Dirty equipment, recreational gear, illegal dumping, and encroachment from neighboring infestations all play a large role. Plant invasion in forests exhibit exponential growth curve. Every good forest management plan includes robust early detection and rapid response to new invasions. Most of the large invasive plants we are removing in Raleigh are less than 20 years old, meaning this is a relatively new problem, and it will only get worse without action. Unfortunately, by the time most people begin to realize the problem, it's too late for affordable action. But we still have the opportunity to protect our remaining intact natural resources. So, although we would like it to be, it is not always about eradication. In fact, it's more about managing a site to be the healthiest ecosystem possible. It's about natural resource protection and enhancement. So we'll discuss an overview of that process. Site assessment is the first step of any management plan knowing the history of the site, its previous usage, and ultimate plan. So did it used to be a farm? Did it used to be a building? What did it used to be? Um, was it always forest? Mapping will help you understand what's on your site. Repeated mapping allows you to track the size of occurrences and success or failure of management practices over time. This will help you alter what types of prescriptions you're applying to your site. 
You will also want to map any rare, threatened, or endangered species on the site. That can help you prioritize your work. Site conditions inform management prescriptions and priorities. So wet and low sites will require a different approach than upland sites. Having good access may move a site higher in priority than more difficult access. We also want to assess the overall quality of habitat. This is so cool. GIS applications are such a powerful way to collect, sort, and analyze your data. The fields for each record can have as much or as little information as the user needs or wants, although more data is always better. Layers can be added to reflect topography, soil types, hydrological conditions, water features, existing infrastructure, even previously applied prescriptions. Users can click on points in the field to view data on species, size, native status, collection date, and many other values. Photos can be added to points for reference into the record. And regardless of your preferred mapping tool, there are great free apps available that can help you identify and map native and non-native invasive species wherever you are. Whether you're in a parking lot, a manicured garden, or in the middle of nowhere in the wild, these apps are easy to use and aid in proper identification. And you don't have to be an expert. Let these apps get you started. You can explore the world around you and start learning about different plant and animal species. There's even an app to help you identify mushrooms. It's called Picture Mushroom and it's my new favorite. Prioritization, early detection and rapid response. So is it a small infestation that can be handled quickly with little resource input? Obviously, this is what we want. This is our gold standard, right? I, I took care of it before it became a huge problem. Um, unfortunately, it is not often the reality. Um, but it is certainly certainly what you would like to do. And then think about protecting the best. What do you have that's the nicest? Is there a rare, threatened, or endangered species there? Is it the highest quality habitats, mostly intact? Is very few non-native invasives? Um, does it have species that require protection? Um, do you have the resources? Do you have access to the resources that you would need to apply effective treatment. Your prescription should consider what your goal is. So are you thinking about eradication through early detection and rapid response? Are you trying to manage just a threshold, like I can live with this amount of invasive species? Are you thinking about containment? Do you just have like a beautiful habitat with a very small trash fire in the middle of it and you just want to contain that trash fire. Um, so what is your goal for your prescription? And what is your target? When is the best time to treat that target? Is your target an annual plant or is it a tree? Is it ephemeral that needs to be treated at a very specific time of year, like this Spicaria verna? And then you need to think about how you're going to go at it using integrative vegetation vegetation management techniques. And we'll talk about those a little bit more in just a minute, but they basically include mechanical, chemical, cultural, and technical controls. You wanna consider all of your options. Can you burn it? Should you burn it? Some invasive species respond very well to control through fire and some invasive species absolutely love fire. You need to be aware of how your treatments, how your applied treatments will affect your target. Will your technique be helpful in moving your management goals forward? Think about what your best scenario is, the timing that you need to do it. Do you want to do it in January or should you do it in August? What the potential outcome of those things would be. Think about feasibility of your prescription. Um, is it even possible to burn where you want to burn? Or do you live right next to 440 and there's no way the Forest Service is ever going to let you do it? Do you even have access 
to the site. The other thing that you need to think about is not just killing the plant, but do you need to remove the vegetative debris that will be left afterwards? If you're talking about invasive tree species, do you need to haul out the wood? Can you fly chip it into the woods or can you just chop it and drop it, leave it there? If you're talking about pulling of microstegium or stilt grass, do you need to bag it and take it out? Or can you live with a giant burial mound of pulled microstegium at your site? This is an example of mechanical control uh, for an intense infestation. In this particular instance, there was no reason to be gentle. So we just took a forestry mulcher and cut the first 20 foot of invasive vines out of the woods or at the edge of the woods. And the result was absolutely stunning. This is what we had found because we had mapped and we knew what was in there. We applied the right prescription. We found the woods again. So integrative vegetation management, it's a mouthful, but it's a versatile approach that can be quickly modified as new techniques and research are introduced. It is important that we remain current and educated so that we can provide the most accurate information to our prescriptions. Methods of IVM are sorted into the following categories. Mechanical, which would include hand pulling, weed wrenches, cutting, in the case of vines, you want to cut low and high, which is called window painting. Um, you could mow, you could dig, bush hog, prescribe burning, weed eating, tractors. Um, then there's cultural. Can you change the light parameters, change soil conditions? In some cases, flooding might be possible or useful. Could you even smother? Here we've got an image of laying down cardboard and putting mulch on top of it. That's certainly effective with some, um, with some targets. There's chemical. Uh, herbicides are used frequently in invasive management. They're often the treatment that is the most effective, inexpensive, and least disruptive to the site. Um, there are some biological controls, some insects or pathogens that can be used to target very specific invasive threats. These must be very carefully evaluated to ensure the biological agents will only harm the intended target and not any other organism. We never want to introduce a problem to solve a problem. An assessment. This is the final step in the management cycle. Notice that I said cycle because you will continue. Once you get on this hamster wheel, you do not get off. We need to constantly learn or improve and constantly learn to improve or adapt as you evaluate the results of your prescription. Basically comes down to one simple question. Did it work? If yes, why did it work? Do you have the ability to scale up the prescription? Are you able to simply move to the next target? Did you leave a hole for the next invasive species? Monitoring is very, very important. So did it work? No, no, it didn't work. Well, why didn't it work? Did you do it at the wrong time of the year? Did you do it at the wrong time of the day? Was it too hot, too cold? Was weather affecting your management? Was it too much or not enough of a prescription? Was it just the wrong prescription? These are all questions you have to ask yourself carefully while you're carefully evaluating whether or not your management plan is working. Now let's talk about some common criminals. So this is mostly English ivy. The hetero species, um, hetero helix in this instance, this is my nemesis. This is, this is a tough one. English ivy is one of the most common of the hetero species in our areas. Among its other bad habits, it smothers the ground, climbs trees and weighs them down, making them more susceptible to wind throw. Think of it as a slower, harder to kill kudzu. It also holds water against the trunks of trees, causing rot. And unfortunately for us, is a vector for oak wilt disease, a disease that will kill mature oaks. The challenging nature of English ivy management 
also makes it one of the most expensive plants to treat, with some companies charging $5,000 an acre for control. Management prescriptions for this type of plant include manual removal of a section of vine at the base of the trees and then repeated pulling or herbicide applications over many years. Incidentally, um, English ivy doesn't mature until it grows up the tree. That's why you want to remove the vine from the tree that stops the mature uh, reproductive process. So it cannot flower or set fruit while it's just growing across the ground unless it matured on the tree and it killed the tree and the tree fell over after the ivy was already mature. I like to call this piece gingers hiding in plain sight. So if you look, you can see the triangular shaped leaves of this lovely little native wildflower, also known as little brown jug, and the English ivy clearly encroaching on its growing space. You find this a lot. It makes English ivy management very challenging because as it moves into our little natives, you have to be extremely careful and pull the plants away from the desirables. Ligustrum species. There are several species of ligustrum, also known as privet, invading our wild areas. In fact, this was stunning. A recent study um, conducted by scientists showed that 60% of the vegetation along our greenway system is privet. Um, that study was just concluded last year. This evergreen invasive plant makes an impenetrable hedge or makes impenetrable hedges that cover acres. Like many pl invasive plants, it thrives on disturbance and moves in to take over when trees fail. To manage privet, you want to pull or dig the smaller plants. Larger stems can be cut and treated with herbicide. If it gets really bad, you can pull them out with a tractor. <laughs> if, again, you have access. This is Japanese honeysuckle. This plant is absolutely everywhere. This is the one I get the most of. What do you mean it's not native? It's been, it's, it's, a, I grew up with this plant. Well, yeah, it's been here for a really long time. Um, I love to hate this plant. Uh, it, it's so pervasive throughout our area that I can, I can say with confidence that a site has an occurrence of Japanese honeysuckle, even if I've never been there. If you're thinking to yourself right now, I wonder if I have Japanese honeysuckle in my yard, my answer to you is yes. This vine is literally eats baby trees, as you can see in the picture. Yeah, I mean, it smells nice, but guess what? We have a native honeysuckle that's much prettier and much better behaved. This is it right here. It's absolutely stunning. So much prettier than that junky stuff. Control of Japanese honeysuckle can include pulling and digging, among other controls. <sighs> ah, this one just makes me sigh. Asian wisterias. The saying, a picture is worth a, a thousand words, definitely applies here. I don't think that looking at this picture, I, I really need to explain how big of a problem Asian mysterious species are. Many times when you encounter an infestation, it's not a sprig, it's a cathedral. Luckily, the Asian species are no longer available commercial, commercially. However, this escapee has already overtaken much of our woodlands. Helpful hint, if you want to distinguish the non-native wisterias from our native species, look for seed pods either on the plant or on the ground. If the seed pod has a velvety coating, it's a bad plant. Large infestations like this are best begun with the use of specialized equipment like a slope mower or a forestry mower. After that, you can go in with a little bit more precise control measures. Microstegium viminium. 
Japanese stilt grass. It looks harmless, right? It's a little annual grass that produces thousands of seed each year. And its straw creates mats of dead vegetation through which even baby trees cannot grow. Once thought to only grow in moist shade, we're now seeing it invade dry upland sites in full sun. This plant came to the US as discarded packing material in a shipment of ceramics. Always be careful what you order. Legend has it that stilt grass came to Raleigh via Hurricane Fran, although I don't know if that's true or not. <laughs> it's absolutely everywhere, but it's really easy to pull. Um, repeated pulling can put a real dent in infestations. The seeds are only viable for about three to five years. So by staying on top of this horrid little grass, you can achieve success. But again, if you have water on your site, it will keep being reintroduced. And those were some of the common criminals, but there are some newer species that are keeping us all on the lookout. Cumulus japonicus, hop vine. Hate this plant. Don't let the fact that it is an annual vine fool you. It can grow 10 foot in a growing season. It's often found growing along creeks and other riparian areas where water aids seed dispersal in its quest for domination. Many thousands of plants can occur in an acre and the fiberglass like hairs on the leaves shred hands and arms when you're pulling it. If you catch it early in the season, like mid April when it's about say 10 to 12 inches, pulling the young plants is relatively easy. Be sure you are wearing long sleeves and leather gloves. This is an evil plant and it will cut you. Ampelopsis brevipedunculata, although I think it might have had a name change. Thank you to the taxonomists. They love doing that. Also known as porcelain berry. This horrible vine species is still available commercially in a lovely variegated form. It's very similar to our native grape species, but can be differentiated because it holds its flowers and fruit up, whereas grape, hold, grape holds flowers and fruit down, stereotypical of a grape cluster. Uh, the fruit of porcelain berry is spread by birds, thank you birds, and you can often find isolated plants under signposts or street lights, anywhere birds like to perch and poop. Nope. It's Ficaria verna season. This is the lovely little fig buttercup. And every year I hear from so many people just how lovely this spring ephemeral is. Well, that's how it got here. It's popularity in the, popularity in the nursery and landscape trade, having been introduced here in the 1860s. It took it a while, but it has shown its true nature. It's native to Europe and West Asia. And it's pretty, but it's nasty. It's escaped and is now considered to be a major threat in 79% of the contiguous US. The window for treatment for this plant is small, February through April, after which it begins to go into dormancy. Having already completed its destructive, destructive cycle of depriving native spring plants the opportunity to feed hungry pollinators early in the season. Unfortunately, control of this plant definitely requires herbicide. Experiments with digging and smothering have not shown success. And in fact, digging can potentially spread the plant further. This is what you should see in the spring, not Ficaria verna. Lagerstromia indica. That's right, people, crepe myrtles. People do not want to hear this, especially landscapers, nurseries, and people that have just moved here from New Jersey. 
but I'm building a case based on actual observations that this plant is becoming invasive. I believe that our birds have finally figured out that they can eat the seeds and are causing this spread. Here it is at one of our nature preserves, Horseshoe Farm, where it has never been planted, so it is proving that it is not suckering from old rootstock. There are other documented occurrences around Raleigh as well, including our own maintenance yard. This is a very difficult to control tree species, widely grown and sold for its toughness. But it's not all bad. It's not all bad. There are some natives that are so insistent, so forceful, so impactful, that they can only be considered heroes. Like superheroes of myths and legend, their personalities are outsized. They are not to be taken lightly or even really used in a conventional garden bed, but they are great at holding their own against even the worst invasions. Chasmanthium latifolium, northern sea oats. This is a fantastic plant that you'll find growing beautifully in many riparian areas. Like many grasses, it's got decorative seed heads that sway in the breeze and persist through winter. It's also a larval host plant for northern pearly-eyed butterfly, which is a woodland species rarely seen in open meadows. It is a prolific seeder and stands its ground in degraded habitats. Again, do not look at this plant at the garden center and say, it's so cute, I'm just going to put one in over here as an accent for my garden. It, it, it won't stay that way. It, it's a beautiful, beautiful, beautiful plant. You should buy it. You should plant it in your woods and you should let it do its thing. Um, don't ignore it because it's aggressive. Just put it in the right place. Unless you just really want a big bed of grass in your garden. Panicum virgatum, switchgrass. It's a horrible name, but it's a lovely plant. It's easy to grow and looks great in a meadow. This grass is not a thug in a garden bed, but it does stand firmly in opposition against non-native invasive plants. Eurebia divericata. This one also just got a name change. It used to just be aster and that was fine. But yeah, Eurebia, that's better. Uh, also known as white wood aster. It flowers profusely in the late summer into fall. It looks like fairy lights. I love this plant. It thrives in most situations, standing more upright in full sun um, and sort of being a little lazier in shade. But it colonizes large swaths as it sprawls. Absolutely beautiful plant. Here are two more. Uh, Monarda fistulosa, also known as bergamo, attracts many different butterfly and moth species and can even occasionally be seen visited by hummingbirds. Um, they really like moist soil and you can use the leaves to make tea. Super versatile. And then there's Physostegia virginiana. Absolutely not correctly named obedient plant. It is anything but. I made this mistake as a novice gardener many, many years ago, and I thought, well, that's lovely. I'll just put a little quart pot of this in my garden. And I would say, I don't know, maybe three years later, I had to restart the whole bed because the obedient plant was, <laughs> I guess it was being obedient because I asked it to grow and it did. Uh, <laughs> But this little rascal has been seen as the only native poking its head up along disturbed sewer easements. So you get it all disturbed, you know, every five years the mowers come in, they chow up those sewer easements and it just gets flooded with invasive plants. And then you'll just see a pink head here and there. And you're like, nope, not the obedient plant. Can't stop it that quickly. It's truly a winner in fighting the good fight. And it's not just forbs and grasses. Shining is a beacon of justice for native habitats. Woody tree and shrub species are doing their part as well. Circus canadensis on the left is a redbud. 
um, and they're a self starter. They will seed themselves absolutely everywhere if you let them. If you plant one of these in the woods or heck, just go gather up a bunch of seeds and scatter them out. Um, you'll have beautiful little edge of the woodland blooming trees in the spring, super early in the spring, which is an important time for, poll for pollinators when food is scarce. The bees that visit these flowers include honeybees, bumblebees, mason bees, cuckoo bees, longhorn bees, mining bees, and sweat bees. They're also the host plants for several for the larvae of several butterflies and moths. Pythia virginica, or sweet spire, forms large suckering color colonies and features fantastically rich fall color. Now, as much as I love Itea and it is touted as a garden plant, when I say that it forms large suckering colonies, I mean large suckering colonies. It can pop up an extra sucker about 12 feet away. It's manageable. I have them in my garden beds. I Once a month, I cut the suckers down. I don't bother digging them out anymore. It's too disruptive to the other plants. I just keep cutting the suckers. So if you're willing to do that and you really want this gorgeous spring bloom and that absolutely stunning red fall color, I'd say it's worth it. Now here, this is this is my heart right here. This is the toughest of the tough. Absolutely the toughest of the tough. It might not seem like it, but Eupatorium colostinum or mist flower is not a plant to underestimate. I've seen many stands of what I thought was pure Japanese stilt grass only to return in the fall to see the misleadingly delicate purple blooms proudly showing off above the canopy of the grass. This is a plant I absolutely love, absolutely love. Would never ever plant it again in a garden bed, made the same mistake that I did with obedient plant. And I thought, well, this will be pretty. It'll, you know, give me a different bloom time. Or it would just be the only plant in the, in the whole bed. <laughs> I ended up digging mine all out and putting them along the edge of a wetland. Because I just couldn't, I, I couldn't stay on top of it anymore. So that's all I have. Does anybody have any questions for me? So if you have questions, feel free to unmute yourself or to throw it in the chat and I'll read it out to Lee. Um, I do have a question for you, Lee. What would you say has been your biggest success with um, dealing with invasives for the city of Raleigh? Oh, gosh. Um, I would say the various pockets of English ivy infestations that I've been working on. Um, those for me have been rewarding. It's been years, in some cases, more than 10 years. Um, but when we started with very, very high levels of infestations, where there was absolutely nothing germinating, the forest was not regenerating, we didn't have any noticeable or were not aware of any native wildflowers or shrubs, um, to now where we do have tree recruitment and we are getting more diversity. And luckily for us, we got on it in time. There were plants lying dormant, just waiting for that little bit of dappled sunlight to come back to them. Um, so we're getting orchids and ferns and, you know, all kinds of beautiful little native plants that are coming through. That's, that's very successful for me. What would you say has been your biggest challenge or your biggest fight <laughs> with, with, uh, the invasives? Can I say people? I really it, it it is it is about education. It is about awareness of the problem. Um, so not just in the parks and on the greenways, but in their own backyards. The plants do not recognize any property lines or boundaries. They they don't know that they're leaving the Smith's yard to come into the park or into the nature preserve. In the same way that they don't know that they're leaving the park or nature preserve to go into the Smith's yard. So if you have a property that has kudzu and it backs up to a park, then the kudzu is just going to move right across the property line into the into the park and vice versa. Um, 
so that's that's really a big like understanding the importance and the need for swift action i think is important and then also illegal dumping is a very big problem for us and by that i don't mean i mean yes i mean the trash no we don't want your tires no we don't want your mattresses no thank you no more grocery carts um but then also yard waste people blowing leaves into our natural sites um and dumping plant propagules bits of english ivy or other things that could take root in our properties that's that's a huge problem and we did have a participant ask if you could send out a list of heroes so if you'll send that to me i can pass it on to our participants yeah uh, absolutely for that uh, and along those lines is somebody that somewhat knows what's good and bad how what can people do when they go to nurseries to look for plants for their gardens to make sure they are truly getting what is native and you know it's appropriate for their yard versus getting something that you know is touted as being good or touted as being native or not a non-invasive that you know we are now finding or have recently found out are truly invasive plants so just like with the crepe myrtles plants don't always show their true nature right away um again it took a while for the birds to figure out that they could eat those seeds right it, it took a long while um so i would recommend at the very least trying to go native as much as possible not all non-native species are invasive like that's you know i've never seen a hosta move like they they stay where you put them unless the deer eat them um and those plants are not native here right like they um it's a very small percentage of plants that are invasive um, and the reason that they're so popular in the nursery and landscape trade is because they have no predators and because they're so easy to establish in a variety of sites the nurseries can guarantee them um and they're also easier a crop an easier crop for the nurseries to grow but i would definitely recommend doing your homework asking for native plants um going to plants that specialize in native plants is helpful there's so much information like just right here you know like you can use your phone you can use one of those apps um if someone if you're at like the lowe's garden center and you may i'm not disparaging lowe's but maybe they don't have somebody there who's a real plant person at that moment they're working with another customer or something like that you can use seek or iNaturalist or something like that to help you determine the origin of that plant is it from europe or is it from north america if it's from north america what part of north america um you can always just google the plant name as well that that works you'll get a ton of hits on that way um and one of the you know stupid google search that i will do is is x name plant invasive like it, it seems stupid but it'll results will come right up either from invasive.org or bugwood or one of the many many um many many sites that can help you many organizations that can help you so uh, the question we got is if there's if kudzu is out of control on someone else's property is there an organization around to notify so if people are noticing you know invases and large invases in areas that may not be somewhere that they can necessarily access is there anywhere they can notify people to try to help with that i would say private property to private property the first thing that you would want to do would be to have a conversation with that property owner um there is not an organization that is in charge of for lack of a better word um either you know charging or uh, giving out abatements or things like that for um invasive plants on private property if it is an encroachment issue on public property such as a park um then you would report it to the parks department or the inspections department if it's something that's spilling out onto the sidewalk or things like that but we don't have any ordinances in place in the city of Raleigh to say you cannot have this on your property. Um, because to be honest, 
the city would be the biggest violator of that ordinance. <laughs> um, uh, so there's there's not really an enforcement arm to say, no, you cannot have this on your property. You can have whatever you want on your property, but it needs to stay on your property. Um, and, I, I, you know, again, education is really key. If you can approach a property or landowner with information, with management options and, you know, convince them that they need to manage this problem. Oftentimes you can have a constructive conversation and and really get really get good results. I, I've I've had those conversations with a lot of neighboring property owners for some of our parks and have gotten very good results from that. Um, just having a constructed, constructive, well-educated um, conversation about what the problem is. The other thing, the, the cool thing with kudzu is that there's a lot of studies that can show that your property value, it, it drops dramatically when you have kudzu on your property. So many individual homeowners are often, they, they perk up when they, you mention that their house value has gone down because of that particular plant. Um, again, it's not that difficult. I guess I never said it, but kudzu is really not that difficult if you have a small infestation. Cutting the vines and um, treating treating the cut stems and then treating regrowth, it's, it's really not that bad. I'm going to drop my video and my sharing because I'm getting bad. Um, Okay, sorry about that. Totally understand. Uh, now for, obviously for the city, we have resources to deal with invasives, but for private citizens that would like to eradicate, you know, infestations of invasives on their property, are there resources for them to help with cost if it is something that does require you know, a um, herbicide or a more mechanical beyond, you know, just ripping it out or cutting it myself. Um, I do know that there's times where there's, you know, large infestations of a invasive on private property um, that you either inherit or didn't realize was an issue. Um, are there invasives or resources for the general public to access to help with that kind of stuff? As far as helping to shoulder the financial burden, none that I am aware of. It is definitely worth continuing to look into it. Ha, you know, as this as this issue becomes more widely known and people are really starting to be concerned about it, there may become um, some options from, I would imagine, a nonprofit, the nonprofit sector. Um, I would continuously look for um, Grants that would be available, like for a neighborhood wide, as opposed to an individual um, property owner. Things uh, there could potentially be stormwater grants. Um, they're very concerned about clean water management. Um, but in this area, no, none that I'm aware of. There are plenty of resources available to help you understand control techniques and management options. Um, and those, those can be useful when you're having conversations. If you're not able to do the work yourself, those will be useful in guiding a conversation with a potential contractor to make sure that they are fully understanding what you expect um, and that they know that you know what you're talking about. So someone had asked, um, what do you treat cut stems of Asian wisteria and when is the best time to do it? So what I use is um, clopyrrolid uh, transline is the trade name, um, but the active ingredient is um, clopyrrolid. Um, and July, unfortunately, is really one of the best times to treat but you can treat the stems anytime. I would just recommend that you cut the stems pretty low to the ground. You don't want to be treating a five foot long stem.
since we are mid February and moving into March, other than the um, buttercup wart you mentioned earlier, is there under invasives that are to be on the lookout for and to be trying targeting treatment and removal of at this time of the year? This is a great time of year to um, treat your evergreen invasive species. Um, so your privets, your um, English ivy, um, your honeysuckle, all of these um, evergreens. Number one, because you can see them. We don't have a whole lot of native evergreens um, that'll trick you. Um, the only thing that you may need to look out for if you're doing privet is some of the native hollies. They can be lookalikes. The trick there is ligustrums let the leaves of ligustrums are opposite each other, directly opposite each other on the stem, whereas on hollies they're alternate, so they will not be directly opposite each other. Uh, this is a really easy cheat, especially because they're both evergreens. <laughs> um, and then again, the honeysuckle, because it's everywhere, if you want to wait until it's things are dormant, um, whether you're pulling or you're doing a foliar application or whatever you're, whatever you're, whatever management technique you're applying, um, if you're pulling it when things are dormant, you're not ripping the leaves off of baby trees, you know, you have a much better chance of doing it without doing any harm. You're also not going to be stepping on a lot of the stuff that's dormant, um, any of the little native wildflowers that are still sleeping. So you got a little bit more room to move around. Um, it's also the only time you're not eating spider webs every five feet through the woods. Um, and I just dropped into the chat a link to the site where you can download the uh, management guide to invasive plants in southern forests from the Forest Service. And it covers a lot of different management techniques and time of year and stuff like that for some of the most common criminals. Thank you for sharing that. Um, so I know you are currently on the lookout uh, for the buttercup. Uh, what is the best way for the public if they see it to notify you of um, sightings of it? Absolutely. So um, please, please, please look for the fig buttercup. Everyone, everyone, everywhere you go, just look, look for it. Um, it's already started blooming. It's a bright yellow flower. It makes a little mound. It looks like a helmet on the ground. Um, and then if you see a whole lot of little mounds on the ground with lots of little yellow flowers, that's a, there's a big old mat. You can map it using iNaturalist, the iNaturalist app, um, or with Seeden, the Southeastern Early Detection Network. Um, we are following those points. Um, we have points from many years now. We've got a coalition, a regional coalition, um, including folks in Durham and the Eno River and all the way down to um, Greenville. Um, we're, we're all kind of working together to, we're really trying to eradicate this plant before it becomes a massive problem for us. Um, again, it, you will find it in the riparian areas. Um, and it's a very, very distinctive little yellow flower. It's super shiny. The leaves are a little glossy as well. Um, unfortunately, you will be fooled by a lot of dandelions. Um, you'd be like, yellow flower, yellow flower. Um, but I also am not averse to anybody ever just sending me an email and saying, hey, I saw it over here. Um, a lot of times people can put a dot on a map um, using their phone and then screen capture that. You can just send me that map or you can just say it was around here. Um, chances are we are sort of aware of it. Um, but chances are also that we didn't see that one before. So, you know, please, please let us know. Um, we want to know where it is. Um, we want to find it and we want to eradicate it if possible. And then outside, of the, are there any other high target plants you're looking for the public to kind of share sightings of with you? Um, or is it mostly just that one at this time? Um, mostly that one at this time, simply because the the window is so small and it's a relatively new plant that we're hunting. So um, if we can, if we can like just have everybody sort of concentrate on that, that's that's very, very helpful. Um, 
unless it's a really unusual one. Um, trying to think uh, like the um, parasol tree um, that we don't see a whole lot of. I would like to know about that one specifically. Um, that's very, very much an urban invasive. Um, so if, if people if people see that one around or any other novel plant where it shouldn't be, that's what I would like to know. Um, this summer, look for those crepe myrtles. I, I really am trying to build a case to have them removed from the planting list for the city of Raleigh. We need to we need to get on this. This is one that we have the opportunity to stop before it gets too far. Um, I have my suspicions about a few plants. Um, I don't know if I'm allowed to besperch their names in public yet, um, but I'm a, I'm a little concerned, honestly, about Japanese maples. I see those coming up in the woods. Um, I have seen Laura Petalums moving around. Um, are they widespread problems? No. Have they been here for a really long time and are therefore not likely to ever become a problem? Maybe. Um, but definitely if you if you see a novel plant in an environment that you know it wasn't planted um yeah yeah i'd love to know about that and christine you have your hand up for a question i do can you hear me we can yes okay good um how do you treat the uh buttercup what do you spray that with i've been trying to pull it and i thought i heard that that one it's pretty unforgiving and I, I can't get to it all. So is there some spray that I could uh, to eradicate that plant? Yes, thankfully there is. <laughs> Great, um, what is it? And you're right, pulling it or digging it, it those bulb bills, you'll never get them all. It's, it's just no. Um, so I use a glyphosate formulation because it's occurring in water. I use one that's uh, formulated for use in aquatic sites, meaning that it is non-toxic to um, aquatic invertebrates. Um, so you could probably find something like that at a tractor supply or agri supply. Um, you're not going to find it at Lowe's. Um, Thank you. But yeah, an aquatic formulation of glyphosate is what I would use. Um, Aquastar. I believe is one of them or rodeo are the um the names yeah thank you yeah good luck <laughs> thanks so you have a question in the chat so if they are not in raleigh um who do you, who would be best to notify and do you potentially have know who in Cary, Apex, or Durham would be best to notify since it's not, they're not with obviously the city of Raleigh. If you are notifying about the Ficaria Verna, you can still notify me. Um, absolutely. And if you just want to put a dot on a map in iNaturalist, we'll see those too. Um, we send weekly notifications through Ficaria Verna season to all of our partners. Um, and so we have in some areas we have um, nonprofits that are working on this. In some places we have volunteers. In some places we have municipal partners. Um, but you can definitely notify me. Um, I can go out and confirm. I can't do any work outside of Raleigh and I can't do any work on private property, but I can certainly put a dot on the map and I can engage with the property owner. And we have another question is when invasive plants have been removed, what are some signs or resources to tell that uh, what native wildlife has begun to come back or establish again. So that again, you know, it all is dependent on the level of infestation. So the point to where it got to, um, if you end up in a restoration phase, which is kind of a kind of a sad phase to be in, that means that there was nothing native left to save. Um, it can take a while for native wildlife to return. Although wildlife can be pretty robust and if there are intact populations nearby, they can move in almost immediately once their resources have been returned. Um, you can start to see if you if you're again, if you're getting it pretty early in the infestation in the 5, 10, 20 year range, there might still be some good stuff laying dormant or in the seed bank. 
it's going to start to pop up. What you're going to really look for is a diversity of plant life, and that will tell you that you have a diversity of wildlife. So once you start to get away from that monoculture or just like a solid wall of privet and you start getting more different kinds of native plants, you, you'll know. Um, you'll also start to see it. Um, it'll go from being a very, very quiet habitat to becoming rather noisy in the summer. <laughs> All right, so we're nearing the end. Does anyone have any last minute questions for Lee? And I will share her email again with you guys um, when I send out the um, EE form in case you guys have any further questions um, that you'd like to ask or that you um, think of after this um, lecture. But if I'll give it, give you guys an opportunity if you have any other questions you'd like to ask. Um, otherwise, we'd like to say thank you for joining us. Um, on your your Valentine Day. Uh, I hope everyone enjoyed this as much as I did. Definitely learned some new things. <laughs> Having worked with Lee closely, um, I know that she does a lot of work for us and has made some great strides. I know for Lake Johnson specifically, um, as well as outside of Lake Johnson Park. Well, it does not appear we have any further questions. Lee, thank you so much for joining us tonight um, and sharing your knowledge. Thank you again, everyone, for joining us. Um, if you have any questions um, bef before I get the email to you, feel free to email me and I can pour forward those on to Lee. And I, again, will be providing her um, or her email to everyone as well as the um, list of heroes that was requested. Thank you for having me, Julie. I really enjoyed it.